this evening. It is a discussion on images and symbols, and I am very interested in that, in the issue of the nature of a symbol. So I'm exploring in terms of Plato's symposium. Now, how do you understand a symbol? And who deserves to be called a symbol? Can we understand it? That's the goal today. That's the goal. What is the process, symbolic process? So in order to get into it, I thought we'd do a little bit of work on the symposium. Primarily, at this point, Alcibiades' speech. And he says in Alcibiades' speech, as he describes Socrates, he says, Socrates, right? He says, I'm going to tell you the truth about Socrates. That's why he starts his speech. He said, you people who were at the banquet, he said, you don't know anything about Socrates. He said, I know the truth about Socrates, and I'm going to reveal it. So he tells them, he is like Marcia the satyr. Then again, he says, Socrates, he is exactly like a Salinos. Now, does that make Socrates a symbol? No, that makes him a likeness. Makes him a likeness. Therefore, we have to play with a couple of ideas on how to see how you can go from metaphor to likeness, to simile, to symbol. So let me leave that for a moment and talk about it. In order to talk about it, I'm going to use this familiar basic four-term analogy. A shepherd is to his sheep as a ruler is to his subjects. Now, we can have an image of the shepherd. We can have an image of the ruler. How do we go from an image to a simile? Well, first of all, in any analogy from which all similes and metaphors and symbols are derived, you have to first appreciate a couple of points. The first is, the first two terms, the shepherd is to his sheep, they're the known terms, and they're always contrasted with what is essentially unknown and mysterious. That's the second set of terms. These are called, therefore, ratios. Ratio of ideas rather than numbers. Now, this, therefore, this pair, is going to be more familiar. It's going to contain some curiosities, but it's much less a mystery compared to the whole mystery involved with how rulers relate to their subjects and how they should ideally do it. So what we need to do is to take a closer look at this way in which these terms can be said to relate. So, like I can say, a shepherd is like a ruler. That's a simile. I can say, a ruler is like a shepherd. It goes both ways. Similarly, I can talk about sheep are like subjects, and subjects are like sheep. So therefore, I really have four ways of exploring this curious idea. I can say, as we did before, a shepherd is like a ruler. And I can also say a ruler, correspondingly, is like a shepherd. I can go the other way around. I can say sheep are like subjects. And equally well, subjects are like sheep. Now, I want to say more about that, but if I just change the word like to is, if I just say a shepherd is a ruler, just drop out the word like, then I've generated a metaphor. And I can say, therefore, Socrates is a, a 
Salinos. You see, we're going to look at this in a minute because what's interesting is that if Socrates is exactly like a Salinos, then he is a Salinos. And that's no longer a likeness. There has to be a lack. There has to be a difference. There has to be a lack. Because if it's identical, it's no longer similar. It moves from likeness to identity, and therefore it's no longer as similar. Now look, what's curious about this, therefore, we can say a shepherd is a ruler, a ruler is a shepherd, a sheep are subjects, etc. In one sense, therefore, all metaphors are lies, because subjects are not sheep, and sheep are not subjects. They're basically lies. Curiously enough, all metaphors, therefore, are lies. By the way, there are no metaphors in Homer. But so carefully, skillfully written. Analogies, many. Similes, many. Metaphors, none. Now, Socrates is said to be like, exactly like a Marcia, that's a satyr, right, who also is a piper and a wonderful performer. He bewitches men through his pipes, and you can see this beautiful picture of a pipe, through the power of his mouth. His tunes are, div are divine, and others who play them have the same effect on their audience. They too bewitch the audience through the tunes and through the power of their mouth, through playing the pipes too. And it said, you know what these songs do, these divine songs? They make us feel the need for the gods and for their mysteries. That's all that's said about the piper, <clears throat> the Marcia. Now, if these are the qualities of the Marcia, so if we say Socrates is like then we have to see to what extent we can say he is less than, more than, equal to. Because if he's equal to it, if he is in every way exactly like the Marcia, then he's not like a Marcia, he is a Marcia. So we'll hold that. <clears throat> now, this is rather curious, more than, less than. And therefore, I'd like to, to uh, pull it apart for a moment before I go into the next one. Uh, the shepherd is like a ruler. A ruler is like a shepherd. Shepherd is like a ruler. Now, a shepherd functions in such a way with his sheep that his primary activity is to care for all, and so he has to have the skill for understanding herding, keeping together and caring. Now, if a shepherd is like a ruler, would he then seek to care the same way and herd? If a shepherd is like a ruler, that can only be the case if the ruler uh, herds his people. But rulers don't herd their people. Shepherds herd their people. Well, we'll look here. Turn it around. Let's look at the other side. A ruler is like a shepherd. Well, like a shepherd in that he uh, uses dogs to keep his people together? No. A ruler is like a shepherd because he brings his people up to the pasture? No, no. He functions. He functions like a shepherd in respect to caring, 
protecting, So in that sense, the ruler is like a shepherd, since that is the prime, one of the primary ways in which a shepherd relates to his sheep. Therefore, that similar is based upon the way in which he functions, the, the ruler functions. Now, if the ruler therefore functions like a shepherd, because he too cares and protects his people, and he tries to protect the lands, does the shepherd function like a ruler and therefore he has to take care of <clears throat> all of the people? Yes, in one way. All right. But ruling in some sense requires some kind of relationship with people and if the ruler is functioning like a shepherd and the shepherd is functioning like a ruler, we have all kinds of curious power, power uh, problems emerging. Let's try one. We can always try it with the word if. If a shepherd is like a ruler and the ruler um, in some sense um, has its sovereignty over the ruled, over a land. A shepherd, in some sense, has something like that. But so let me ask this question, all right? Is a shepherd more like, more like a ruler? then the ruler is like a shepherd? As we think about this, this is studying relations. If a shepherd is more like, a, to the degree that a shepherd is more like a ruler, then his sheep are gonna to have to become more like people. If the ruler is like a shepherd, then he too is going to have to have find some similarities more on the side of the shepherd than on ruling. Hmm. Let's try another one. Is a shepherd more like a ruler? I'm going to add one more word here, the word we used before. Does a shepherd function more like a ruler than the ruler functions like a shepherd? Or would you say, no, it's quite similar? Well, when you reflect this way, watch what happens when we just change the terms and notice what happens. Let's move it, take this out, and just substitute the other two terms. All right? Uh, are sheep more like subjects? Or are, or, or are subjects more like sheep? Which? Are sheep more like subjects? Or are subjects more like sheep? Would you agree, as you look at this, subjects can be sheep-like, right? and when sheep are like subjects, are the subjects 
more like sheep? <laughs> I, I like this. Now let's try it. Are sheep more like subjects than subjects are like sheep? Because that's what we're saying when we make this kind of relationship. That's what we're saying. So I'd like to use that now back here. All right. Because this is going to stress that there has to be some likeness that has to be accepted in this, and it has to be, have a certain balance. Now, suppose we were to say that there are some similes where one is much more like the other than the other is like it. All right, let's try it. Well, here we have one, by heavens. This Marcia, Marcia is to its qualities as Socrates is to his qualities. Well, here we have all the qualities. Now, this is more known. This is more known. It comes first. This is the thing we must puzzle out, trying to figure out just what Socrates or who or what he is. So when Alcibiades then describes Socrates, which is most interesting, is that when he makes this comparison, which I'd just like to read you quickly, a couple of things, what he says that is that in every respect, Socrates is much greater, is much greater than the thing to which he's being compared. I say further, he is like Marcia the satyr. Well, anyway, Socrates, your face is like them. I don't suppose you will... Uh, Deny that yourself. In everything else, too, you're like them. Listen to what comes next. You're a bully, aren't you? If you don't admit that, I'll find witnesses. Well, aren't you a piper? Yes, a more wonderful performer than the Marcias. For he used to bewitch men through instruments by the power of his mouth. And so also now does anyone who pipes his tunes. For those Olympus piped, I say, were from Marcia who taught him. Then it is his tunes, whether a good artist plays them or a common piping girl, which alone enravish us and make plain those who feel the need of the gods and their mysteries, because the tunes are divine. The only difference between you is that you do the very same without instruments, by bare words. We, at least, when we hear someone else making other speeches, even quite a good orator, no one cares, choked. I might say, but when one hears you or your words recited by another, even a very poor speaker, let a woman here or a man here or a boy here, we're overwhelmed and enravished. I, indeed, my friends, if you would... If you had not have thought me completely drunk, would have taken a solemn oath before you and described to you how this man's words have made me feel and make me feel now. So therefore, in every one of these ways, we find, therefore, he's being contrasted. And in that respect, he's, he's a greater piper, more wonderful performer. He bewitches not through, the, through an instrument, but through words, the power of his mouth, through words. His tunes, too, uh, bewitch us. His words bewitch us, powerful as they are. And they, too, make us feel the need for the gods and the mysteries. And in that respect, then, this relationship, which do you want to say? 
that a Marcia is like Socrates or Socrates is like a Marcia. Because if this is the greater, by far the greater, then there are many things which the Marcia cannot find a parallel. Well then, if he exceeds in each one of these categories, then there are some functioning similarities, but the unlikeness is more unlike than like. Because he goes beyond each of the, of the qualities, he goes beyond, therefore these are the greater qualities more profound than these. To the degree that these qualities are here, more profound here, to that degree, Socrates himself is more profound than Marcia. Well, he uses another very beautiful image, and something else takes place here. Now, here we have an image of Socrates after all, even his face looks like a Marcy, he says. That's an image. So now we're going to take the next one. There's this Socrates is like a Salinos. Wow, I happen to have sketched here for you some beautiful picture of Marcy. And there's a, pardon me, a Salinos. There's my Salinos, as you can see. And they're little figures, they're um, crafted. Uh, craftsmen make them in statuary shops. And, you know, if you open them up, they have a little uh, door there, they open them up. And then they're opened up, they show images of the gods inside. So the whole point is, open them up, so you can then see the images of the gods inside. That's a Salinos figure. Wow. Wow. Alcibiades introduces the comparison with Socrates with the image of Socrates as like a Salinos and is very much like a Marcia. He drops the image of Salinos entirely, except for one, one, one sentence in the uh, second paragraph, and reserves the exploration of how he's going to use this until the end of the speech. Now, what do we have so far then? We have in the comparison of the Comparison with the Marcia, he is unlike the unlikeness is in respect to a greatness for Socrates. Now, how is he going to deal this with this, the Salinos figure? Well, That's a simile, and um, I would like to deal with this problem of likeness and unlikeness, but before I do it, I should just read you the most important section in the comparison with the Salinos. Alcibiades wants to describe Socrates with such care that he wants to make sure he can reveal the character of Socrates. So after he tries these comparisons with the Marcia, and then he talks about Socrates as a man and gives all the qualities of Socrates, he then goes back the last two paragraphs of his speech. And he then concludes with this paragraph. One could quote many other things in praise of Socrates, wonderful things. Of his other habits, one might perhaps say much the same about other men. Yet it is, it is his not being like any other man in the world, ancient or modern, that's worthy of all wonder. Men like Achilles might be found. One might take, for example, Brasides or others, or again, men like Pericles, such as, ne such as Nestor and Antenor. And there are more besides. And we might go on with our comparisons. But as for this man, so odd, both the man and his talk, 
none could ever be found to come near him, neither modern nor ancient, unless he is to be compared to no man at all but to Salinas' and satyrs of which I have compared him and his talk. So here then in the end he says, look, there are no comparisons. He says you can't compare him to other men. I cannot compare him with other men. Ancient or modern, therefore you have to go for these figures. You have to go for these images. But yet, when we went with the image of the Marcia, very clearly, it was, in, it was inadequate in respect to finding parallels with the figure of Socrates. Not in Salinas. Let's see what he does with him. For indeed there is something which I left out when I began, that even his talk is very like the opening of the Salinas's. When you agree to listen to the talk of Socrates, it might seem at first to be nothing but absurdity. Such words and phrases are wrapped outside it, like the height of a boisterous satyr. Packasses, smiths, shoemakers, and tanners is what he talks about. And he seems to be always saying the same things in the same words, so that any ignorant and foolish man would laugh at them. But when they are opened out and you get inside them, you will find his words first full of sense as no others are. Next, most divine and containing the finest images of virtue and reaching furthest, in fact, reaching to everything which it profits a man to study who has become noble and good. So now, what was that comparison with the Salinos? Was it with the Salinos? Or was it with the figure within him? Well, you have to open him up, and when you open him up, you'll find his words. You'll find words in there. That's what you'll find. You'll find his words. And they're full of sense, and they're most divine. They're the finest images of excellence or virtue. And anyone interested in becoming noble and good, he says, this will take you the furthest way. Well then, to what extent did he need a Salinos for this image of Socrates? Well, open up. You have to open up. You have to open yourself up to his words then you will have to find in the words, in his words, words that are full of sense. You'll have to discover they are most divine, containing the finest images of excellence or virtue. You have to do that. So you have to do that. And when you do, now we can say, as the Salinos, when opened up, can, one can see the images of the gods. So when you open up the words of Socrates, so you too can see words that are full of sense and most divine with the finest images, not of gods, but of excellence for any man who wants to become noble and good. But let's see, you can't compare him with any man. Now, how much did we get of the Salinos? Well, we got uh, just the door, just the door. He didn't use the, the rap. He didn't use the pan pipes, because he too has pipes. He just used that central figure, the door, with figures showing images of the gods inside. So he selected that as the basis for making his comparison. Well, these are images of the gods. These words are most divine. They are most divine. Therefore, which is the greater again? Well, an image of the gods is one thing. 
but to be able to find words that are full of sense and most divine, containing the finest images of excellence, which, which is the greater, uh, which one would require the greatest craftsman? A craftsman had to make this, Socrates says, uh, Alcibiades says, craftsmen make them and you find them in statuary shops. Here there must be some craft or there's something parallel going on. There is some craft that makes these words as divine as they are. These bring people to a sense of the mysteries and to, the, and to awaken a spiritual sense in them. Therefore, these are most direct. These are more direct. They're not images. They have a vitality to them. They have an intelligibility to them. You have to enter into it. You have to enter into it. You have to participate in it. It's not merely viewing something visually. Therefore, this is the greater. Again, in, ba in, in both cases then, the Marcia and the Salinos, in being compared, are the weaker, not the stronger. Well, what do we do with this? In other words, what we're finding, curiously enough, uh, we can say, Mar Marcia uh, is to those qualities we mentioned a moment ago. The Salinas is to the images when the figure is opened up. And when we compare that against Socrates, we find that the qualities here are far in excess and the images <coughs> contained in Socrates opening up are not images but are in fact are presented in the, uh, as a dynamic. This is a static image in the Salinos. This is a dynamic image when they're opened up. Here you just need to see, here you participate. Uh, here you can put it on your, your uh, counter here you have to participate fully in here, in the Socratic world. Therefore, and again, do you see why it would be fair to say that Socrates exceeds these two similes? Now, when, 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 you, can only, when you can only discover a lesser, lesser relationships, that means the greater are, are left without any comparison, no comparison. Therefore, what's curious in this Alcibiades' speech is that Alcibiades says, you know what Socrates is really like? He's not so what he's like. I've never seen anyone for the qualities and the virtue that Socrates has. So he says there's endurance, Courage, keeping his cool, or sometimes called temperance, and wisdom. Well, in Alcibiades' speech, he gives very fine examples of Socrates' courage in war and his endurance disclosed in various campaigns and how he's able to keep his... Uh, his cool or his uh, a temperate mind, which is kind of a level-headedness, uh, even during campaigns where they were defeated and they were run, had to uh, retreat from the enemy, he was able to maintain a steadiness throughout. So he has very fine examples of this, of this, but none for this. Because he says in the beginning of his speech, he said, I can't turn and listen to this man and to his words. He said, I, I, I just can't do that. And even now at this moment, I know in my conscience that if I 
if I would open my ears, I could never hold out. But I would be in the same state for he compels me to admit that I am very remiss in going on neglecting my own self but attending to Athenian public business. So I force myself and stop my ears and off I go running as from the sirens or else I should sit down on the spot beside him till I become an old man. I feel towards this one man something which no one would ever think could be in me to be ashamed before anybody. But I am ashamed before him and, and before no one else. For I know in my conscience that I cannot contradict him and say it's not my duty to do what he tells me. Yet, when I leave him, public applause is too much for me, so I show my heels and run from him. And whenever I see him, I'm ashamed and I feel confused. And I'm ashamed of what I uh, confessed. Often enough, I should be glad to see him no longer among mankind. But if that should happen, I'm sure um, I should be sorrier still. So I don't know what to do with the fellow. So he runs away from the words. Since he runs away from the words, he doesn't have any example of this. So in that splendid speech, as you look for it, there's no, there's no description of this. That is to say, he has nothing that he can show in a comparison. Therefore, that's the weaker, necessarily the weaker side of an analogy. Now look here. <clears throat> Let's try this now. See if we can pull some things together. Here's a very interesting point. You can be like Socrates. There can be likenesses and unlikenesses. But because you can be like Socrates, does that mean Socrates is going to be like you? Because this is the weaker side. This is the weaker side. The less. It's the unlike. Therefore, what happens, therefore, when you find that there is an exceeding likeness, such as we have here? Well, the more that likeness becomes identical, then you have a metaphor. To the degree that the, you can continuously develop your likeness to him, to that degree, we can say, you are a Socrates. Who is that? You are a Socrates. That's a metaphor. But that's only if all of the qualities, all of the qualities here, to the same degree, can be found developed on this side. And that is what Alcibiades is saying. He said, you can't, find, you can't find any comparison with other men, either ancient or modern. Therefore, he says, this possibility is not likely. He rules this out. Therefore, he's beyond images. He's beyond images. Then, if that means so, he was beyond even Achilles. He's beyond all of the great figures of the past, all the archetypes. Achilles is an archetype of the, the most beautiful example of someone who has developed and uh, developed to the highest point of their level of achievement, and he can accomplish the greatest. Therefore, Socrates is something new. That's what Alcibiades is saying. Hey, look here. We have something here that's new. We have something new. He's totally new. Well, how can we talk about his newness? <clears throat> the only, like a good example, we were comparing Socrates and Jesus last time. And I'd like to go back to this. <clears throat> What's interesting about the figure of Jesus in the scripture is that Jesus is very keenly aware <clears throat> of scripture and much of his actions, especially the latter part, called the Passion, he's very clearly aware of scriptures and he's following scripture. <clears throat> he's acting in accordance with it. Scripture becomes his model. 
to that degree he is becoming like the model. He's functioning in respect to that model. He keeps his eye on the model, and so he acts. To that degree, the model, or the reference to the scripture, is superior, because he's acting out something, he's following it. He's even telling people to do things in order for the scripture to be fulfilled. It's not that the situation emerges spontaneously to fulfill it, no, no, no. He wants the conditions to be present so that he is fulfilling it. Therefore, he sees himself in this story as meeting, setting the conditions. He sets the conditions. He is setting the conditions for the fulfillment. He is setting the conditions. They don't arrive spontaneously. Over here we have Socrates. Now, Socrates in a similar way has a certain very profound spirituality, but his is negative. He has a little voice sitting on his shoulder, as it were, that only tells him no, no, never yes. No model. No model. And there's a profound difference between the two. Therefore, Socrates then can engage in action and so long as he has no prohibition, he goes ahead and does what he does, guided only by his own vision. Now, that difference, see, let, let, let's perhaps stay here. See, that difference is that there isn't any model. He's not fulfilling any scripture. He's not setting conditions. He's allowing whatever conditions to emerge to be his opportunity for being himself. And that self, his, that, that self is really, as he describes it in the Apology, is to just be one thing, given this, to be a philosopher. That's what he says. That's it. That's where I am. Is there going to be a lot, a lot of, of these people came before me, nothing new. There'll be some that will be coming after me. They'll meet a similar fate, most likely, he says. But he says, make no doubt about the fact that I am in the service of the gods. Not because he has a model, but for this really very interesting quote, because he has been commanded to be a philosopher, and that's all he does. And he takes on whatever follows as accordingly. So let me just... And I maintain that I have been commanded by the God to do this through oracles and dreams and in every way in which some divine influence or other has ever commanded a man to do anything. He's been commanded. What God commands me, make no mistake. There's no greater good for you in the city in any way than my service to God. <clears throat> um, now, what is it that he's doing? He says, oh, you know what I'm doing? Philosopher. That's right. I'm a philosopher. That's my job. I've been appointed to be a philosopher by God. Then, gentlemen, I should have been acting strangely of Potidaea and Amplipolis and Dilion. I stayed where I was, posted by my captains, whom you had chosen to command me. Like anyone else, I risked death, but where God posted me, as I thought and believed, with the duty to be a philosopher, So he sees that the thing that's most central to his way is to be a philosopher. That's what it is. So what is he doing? He introduces into history, he introduces into history dialogues, questions, <clears throat> kinds of explorations, most challenging.
That's what he does. For which then people, according to his great quote in the Republic, people must come back again and again and again and again, not he, but others may come, must be reincarnated again and again to live through and complete the dialogue, to understand the whole thing. Therefore, what he's bringing, which we find in this symposium, is that he says, I have to take men from ignorance to right opinion, to understanding, to this kind of knowledge or wisdom. So, this is what he's doing as a philosopher. He's getting people to recognize their own ignorance, to wake them up to the need to find a way to reach knowledge or wisdom, they have to then learn the right opinions about how to proceed. They then have to understand the reasons why they're right. They then have to engage in the activity to participate in this. That's what he calls in the symposium philosophy. And as he says, this wisdom is the most beautiful thing, right? Most brilliant, most beautiful thing. And the philosopher is between like love is, like love is, because love and philosophy are the same thing, right? Love of wisdom. The reason the philosopher loves wisdom is because wisdom is the most beautiful of all possible things. And therefore, the philosopher moves from ignorance, recognizing his own ignorance, and so he proceeds through love, through the perception of that which is most beautiful, and that's hitting into the nature of ultimate reality that vision of ultimate reality is beauty itself. Therefore, that kind of knowledge or wisdom, huh, what one encounters is beauty itself, the nature of ultimate reality. What's philosophy? Waking up to this, going through these stages. Therefore, in the myth, as we all know, in the myth of poverty, plenty, and love, Love comes into existence at the birth of Aphrodite. Aphrodite is divine beauty. Therefore, at the same time the gods are celebrating the birth of Aphrodite, divine beauty, that's the day love is born, and he pursues and is an attendant of Aphrodite. Because once we catch a glimpse of beauty, we are hot on the trail of it. And therefore, love then becomes called the philosopher. Why? Because philo means love, and sophia means wisdom. And once he catches a glimpse of the beauty of Aphrodite, he's hooked. Like anyone who catches a sight of wisdom is hooked. So therefore, Going back now, look here. <clears throat> he now goes into another side of love in the symposium, which is a very curious part. This is, we've been talking about greatness all of the long, the difference between the greatness, unlikeness on the side of greatness of one. Now he also talks about another kind of love, in the symposium in Aristophanes' speech. <clears throat> now, beauty, once seen, once glimpsed, one pursues. And there's a whole range of things that one regards as beautiful and therefore one can proceed on each level where one encounters beauty the more complex, so on. But it's all the same, finding beauty. But in um, Aristophanes' speech, the great comedian, he's now going to deal with the problem of unlikeness and the lack of distinction. He's taking the other side in that speech. Just as in Alcibiades' speech, in the similes and the metaphors, he goes for greatness so in Aristophanes' speech, he goes for less, and he deals with the implications of that. So we'll take the other side. 
So in Aristophanes' speech, he, he ends that great speech of Aristophanes, which everyone remembers, I'm sure, of the creature, a man originally was so constructed that he had four legs and four arms and two heads, and uh, he was so powerful, was he not, that you know what he did? He went to storm heaven. All right, that's what he did. And so Zeus was so upset, all right, he decided there's only one thing to do with man, split him down the middle. That way you can make more of them. And in that way, there'll be more sacrifices for the gods. It'll bring peace because these things originally were called titans and they were trying to get into heaven, storm heaven. Like some of my neighbors do, they knock on my door on Sunday morning, want me to get to heaven. Storm heaven! Yeah, you ought to have that rent a kid, you know? Same kid goes around with different families. In any case, right? Uh, <clears throat> now they're separated. Therefore, there are three races, male, male, female, female, male, female. That's the way they used to be, only three types. Now that they're split, that explains homosexuality and heterosexuality. Well, he goes to an interesting exploration of whether you're, not, whether you're talking about homosexuality or heterosexuality, even though for the most part he stresses homosexuality. And this is where he then explores it, where the, it is an issue of lack of distinction and what follows from that. Lack of distinction can also be put, lack of discrimination. Let's see if we can push it. He says, finally, he said, you know, when, uh, I'll, I'll just read the introduction to, the, to it so you can just follow it quickly. Um, He talks about um, um, well, um, but those which are a cutting of the male, those that are cutting of the male, 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 pursue the male, and while they are boys, being slices of the male, they are fond of men and enjoy lying with men and embracing them. And these are the best of boys and lads because they are naturally bravest. Some call them shameless, but that's false. No shamelessness makes them do this, but boldness and courage and manly force, whether, uh, which uh, welcomes what is like them, which welcomes what is like them. All right? He sees it as, right? Because there is a great likeness. There's no difference between us, right? Male, male, no, no likeness, no difference. Now here's a great proof. When they grow up, such as these alone are men in public affairs. And when they become men, they fancy boys and naturally do not trouble about marriage and getting a family. But law and custom compels them. They find it enough themselves to live unmarried uh, together. Such a person is always inclined to be a boy lover or a beloved, as he is always welcomes what is akin. So when any of these meets his own proper half, whether boy, lover, or anyone else, then they are wonderfully overwhelmed <clears throat> by affection, intimacy, and love, and never wish to be apart for a moment. Ah, here is the most interesting part. Although, he says, they could not say what they expect to get from each other. Couldn't say what they expect to get from each other. Therefore, there's something about their relationship that's a profound mystery. So when they get together, right, there's a great mystery. Because they can't exactly say what they expect to get from each other. Then he goes on. The soul of each wants something else. What? It cannot say. And this, of course, is when he brings in Hephaestus. And this is what I call the dialogue of the five ifs, one after the other. They kind of follow one another like cascading water, one pound after the other, bringing this to a conclusion. Pl 
plainly the soul of each wants something else. What it cannot say, but it divines and riddles what it wants. And as they lie together, suppose Hephaestus were to uh, stand beside them with his tools and ask, hey, what do you want from each other? None. If they were at a loss, suppose he should ask again, is it only that you desire to be together as close as possible and not to be apart from each other night or day? For if that is what you desire, I'm ready to melt you and weld you together so that you too may be made one. And as one, you may uh, live together as long as you live. And when you die, you may die still one instead of two and in yonder world uh, in the house of Hades together. Think. If this is your passion, and if it will satisfy you to get this, if that were offered, we know not a single one would object or be found to wish anything else. He would simply believe he had heard what he had long desired and to be united and melted together with his beloved and to become one from two. So therefore, they would then go into the next world, spend their lives together with a profound mystery, and then they'd go into the next world, right, in the land of Hades, still with that profound question of which is what they want. So how does uh, Aristophanes end this? Of course, he doesn't maintain the theme of the story. He dumps his whole beautiful speech, funny as it is, comic as it is, because this is the way he ends it. But indeed, I speak in general of all men and women that the, the way to make our race happy is to make love perfect. And each to get his own beloved and to go back to our original nature. If this is the best thing possible, the best thing to our hand must, of course, to become as near it as possible, and that is to get a beloved who suits our mind. Well, what did you just do? He abandoned this whole structure and said the choice of the beloved shouldn't be based upon any of these distinctions at all, but should be based on this distinction that you get one person who suits your own mind. So that this entire development that he built uh, lacked fundamentally any resolution of his problem. Therefore, when he's exploring love, for him, love is a mystery. And he offers a possible solution of finding someone who suits your own mind, but that rejects his entire developed speech. So here we have a comparison where there's a fundamental lack, a mystery, a lack, a lack of understanding built into the story. On the other side, when we're talking about uh, Socrates' speech with Diotima, the object of love being beauty is signaled in a very fine and simple way because he says, um, he's talking about contemplating the perfection of beauty which is the last stage in the philosopher's quest. There in life and there alone, my dear Socrates, said the inspired woman, is life worth living for man while he contemplates beauty itself? Okay. There in life and there alone, my dear Socrates, is life worth living for man when he contemplates beauty itself? That's the meaning and purpose of life. Right. There's no mystery about it. Therefore, it fulfills itself as this lacks. So therefore, right, we have something interesting as we go through this. <clears throat> the images of Socrates, that physically that's easy to understand. But when you try to understand him, we find that images fail, metaphors fail, similes fail, 
even when they are well constructed, they fail because we can't find anyone like him, sufficiently like him, and that he exceeds all the figures that are brought to our attention, both men, both present and past, both modern and ancient. All the images lack because he's much greater than them all. When you have that condition, right, when you have that condition where all you have is a physical image, all you have is a physical image that exceeds all comparisons for which there is no living, right, present, or past figure comparable, comparable, that exceeds all similes and metaphors yet harbors all of the greatness, not the less, all the greatness, then that person passes from the capacity of being an archetype to a symbol. Therefore, Socrates becomes the symbol. Therefore, in Plato's Symposium, we find that Plato becomes the symbol of philosophy. Or we can say Socrates then is the symbol for, so for a philosophy. Right? Socrates is the symbol of philosophy. Having gone through all of the stages from ignorance to right opinion to understanding and culminating in the uh, uh, experience and the nature of beauty itself and then turns around and shares it all with us. Now, that's the most amazing part of this dialogue because the dialogue is constructed now to say that something is coming into the world with Socrates which is profoundly different than anything that came before it. And I'd like to just read you that one line. Right, now he's talking about the relationship with Diotima, his teacher. For by attaching himself to a person of beauty, I think, and keeping company with him, though it's a female, he begets and procreates what he has long been pregnant with. Present and absent, he remembers him, and with him fosters what is begotten. So that as a result, these people maintain a much closer communion together and a firmer friendship than parents of children because they have shared between them children more beautiful and more immortal. And everyone would be content to have such children born to him rather than human children. He would look to Homer and Hesiod and the other good poets and wish to rival them who leave such offspring behind, which give their parents the same immortal fame and memory as they have themselves. So therefore, from this point, he sees, therefore, that it's possible from this development for what comes to birth is something that can rival the writings of Homer and Hesiod, which whether religious or spiritual, you can say, uh, incorporated the spiritual and, and uh, religious teachings of their age. Therefore, in the symposium, right when he's right where Plato is writing about it, he's saying, you know what we have here? We have something developing here, the Socratic figure, and this Socratic figure we will be able then, through this process, bring to birth in themselves, through this curious study of philosophy, something that will rival the religious traditions of both Homer and Hesiod. That is to say, a new kind of spiritual activity will come into existence, and that's philosophy. And therefore, Socrates becomes the symbol of philosophy. That's the symbol, and that's what I wanted to explore this evening. So, thank you. Thank you. That's it. All right? Yes, great. Okay. Question? Hold it. You nearly got away. <laughs> nearly got away. Um, you were talking about the, the part where uh, Socrates was a physical image. Yes. 
Yes, just just like a Marcia. Face looked like him. He's a bully. Yes, physical image. And then there were archetypes like Achilles. You made a jump there from a, from a, from a image, physical image. Well, okay, physical image. All right, he looks like a a bus, uh, um, Marcia. <clears throat> you know, at the Getty Museum, at the uh, in the one at least uh, at Malibu, there's a statue of a Marcia, and you look at it, and it's exactly like Socrates. The trouble is, the statue is called a Salinos. They got the wrong name on it. So. Oh. They have the wrong name on it. They call it a Salinos. It's really a Marcia. Yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> and okay. So the physical image, there we have him. All right, there we have him. All right, everyone recognizes him. So he, we can move from a physical image that we can recognize to seeing within him then all of the qualities and functions on the highest level. That's how it moves from an image which we then can recognize, or simply have to recognize. So he personifies in himself philosophy, which is said then to rival Homer and Hesiod. So he's, he's symbolic because those qualities have not been replicated in the past. That's right. That's the, uh, yeah, and therefore he becomes the symbol for those. So that set of qualities, that set of practices and developments that he brought into existence he now becomes the symbol for them. You were claiming he didn't have a model. Mm -hmm. Everything was no, 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 no. Yeah, no model. No model. Uh, how can you say no without a model? I mean, no is a comparison. That's what he says. He says, uh, he says you know, when I go near towards something, he says, I hear no, I'm like, what? Uh, but to never to do. Never to follow. Never to do. Never to pursue it. No. <laughs> yeah, it's much like, you know, the hand on the hot stove, you know. No. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, he was like, oh, I mean, yeah. the rest of the world's like a hot stove. Wow, that's pretty yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. Just whisper, hey, no. Pulls back. Well, well, every time I see him in these, in these dialogues, he's always discussing some idea and bringing it to some no. It's not mm -hmm. the truth. So, but then he would have to know the truth, right? I mean, that's where it goes. So the word truth admits of many, many. Uh, uh, so falsity is like a hot plate in the sky. Yeah, that's where I put it. All right, all right. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, then thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me bring this to you.